Welcome back to another macabre mini mystery. If you're new here, then welcome. My name is Nikki. And if you're not new, then nice to see you again. Today, I'll be looking at one of the most twisty, turny stories I think I've covered to date. And if you like a wild ride, then this one will be right up your street. Today, don your Nike trainers and fire up your spaceship, because we're headed into the bizarre world of Heaven's Gate. to talk to you about the most urgent thing that is on our mind and what we suspect is the most urgent thing on the minds of those who will connect with us. We'll title this tape, Planet Earth About to be Recycled. Your only chance to evacuate is to leave with us. Stop, 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 stop. This one has been on my list for a long, long time. A long, long time. If you don't know anything about Heaven's Gate, then let me tell you, if you're new to cults, this is not entry level. This is like the cultiest of cults. So if you're looking for something less culty, then I'm sorry, I can't help you today. I remember as a child seeing the news reports on TV about this case and being morbidly fascinated by the strange images that were shown of the Nike trainers under the purple shrouds and ever since I've always found this case to be super interesting and I'm sure you will too. This one does come with a bit of a warning because there will be discussions of mental health issues, manipulative behaviour and also suicide and I will be including news report footage from the scene in the video version of the show which whilst it isn't graphic might be a little upsetting for some so if that's too much for you right now then I'll see you next time or head on over to another one of my videos which isn't quite as dark. I promise you there are some on my channel. I also want to say that I know there are some real experts about this particular organisation out there and I'm not professing to be one, I just want to tell you the story so I'm going to add some deep dive materials that I found to be really informative in my sources in the description. So if you want to learn more and there's a ton of information out there then I recommend checking those out. So to begin with, let's start at the end because that's where most people recognise this case from. This is the CBS Evening News. With Dan Rather reporting from CBS News headquarters in New York. Good evening. We're devoting much of the broadcast to one of the biggest mass suicides in U.S. history and the cult at the center of it. Officials said today that the 39 men and women whose bodies were found in this Southern California mansion took their lives using drugs, alcohol, and perhaps plastic bags. It's a bizarre story, still far from over, so we'll start where it began in San Diego County, in exclusive Rancho Santa Fe. Correspondent Bill Whitaker is there. Today, San Diego authorities perform the grim task of removing 39 bodies from the exclusive hillside mansion. It appears, say investigators, members of a cult-like religious group who called each other angels committed mass suicide, forever to be remembered as angels of death. This is a tragedy, and my heart goes out to the families and relatives uh, of these victims. We hope to soon notify them to let them know about this tragedy. Investigators haven't yet determined a cause of death, but they say there were no signs of foul play. Preliminary toxicological tests found a deadly mixture of alcohol and phenobarbital. 39 people were found dead in a mansion in San Diego, California. They weren't brutal murders, but they were neatly laid out corpses on beds, all wearing identical outfits and trainers, and each covered in a purple shroud apart from two of the bodies which were seemingly the last two people to die, so they weren't covered up. 
All of the bodies that were discovered that day had the same short cropped hair, which led to some initial incorrect reports that all the bodies were male, but in fact, the slight majority of them were actually female. An anonymous tip-off was called into the police, which is how they discovered the bizarre scene at the mansion, and that's when the police arrived. All had seemingly committed suicide, using a carefully prepared mix of barbiturates, sleeping tablets and alcohol. So how did these 39 people end up dead at this beautiful mansion in San Diego on March the 26th, 1997? For that, we have to head back 25 years to 1972 to meet two very interesting individuals. Bonnie Nettles was a nurse when she first met Marshall Applewhite in 1972. Bonnie had been dabbling heavily in a range of mystical activities, and by this point she loved astrology and was a follower of theosophy and occultist philosophy, which in incredibly simple terms believes that people should live as one brotherhood, regardless of anything such as age, race, gender, and all those pigeonholy terms we like to define ourselves by. Now, I don't agree with religion as it's responsible for a multitude of terrible things, and like all religions, there's probably something dreadful lurking underneath this one, but to me, that sounds pretty perfect. So Bonnie had also been conducting seances and had a spirit guide, a monk called Brother Francis. Now, Brother Francis told her to look out for a tall man with fair hair that would soon be in her life. Whilst working, Bonnie walked into a room where Marshall was visiting a friend in hospital, and according to him, their eyes met and they made an instant spiritual connection. The two got chatting, and it wasn't long before either Bonnie had suggested, or Marshall asked her, to carry out an astrology reading for him. Now, Bonnie was married with four children. Marshall was single, but had been previously fired from his job as a music teacher due to a relationship he was having with a male student of his. Bonnie and his relationship was purely a platonic one, and despite leaving her husband and children, their elopement was purely spiritual. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a very strange thing to do, to just suddenly up and leave, and leave all your children and your husband behind, unless she didn't like him. Anyway, the pair's expedition of enlightenment took about six months before they started to form solid ideas. They knew they were looking at building a religion around Bonnie's love of astrology, but also her tendency towards New Age beliefs. And also, they sprinkled in a little bit of Christianity in there too. After all, Marshall was a devout Christian, so that appealed to his ideals as well. Also, they liked the idea of getting into heaven as quickly as possible. A few years down the line, Bonnie had started to receive messages from aliens and started to tell Marshall about her contact with them and how, actually, Jesus and God were aliens. With their theories partially formed, they started moving around from town to town and holding meetings where people were invited along. These meetings were very relaxed and welcoming. No pressure was put on attendees and people could ask as many questions as they wanted, which made them very approachable. By this time, Bonnie and Marshall had abandoned their names and asked people to refer to them as Bo and Peep, T and Doe, like the sound of music, and Giddy and Pig. However, they also went by the enigmatic The Two. Attendees to the meetings the pair were carrying out were intrigued by the updated version of Christianity that they pitched. One of their theories was that Mary, as in Jesus' mum, you know the one, well, she was abducted by aliens and impregnated on a spaceship with an alien baby. The two managed to start to amass followers and by the mid-70s had over 700 people as part of the cult. They also went through two different name changes over the subsequent years, starting off with Human Individual Metamorphosis and changing to Total Overcomers Anonymous, before they finally settled on Heaven's Gate in the mid-90s, perhaps with their end goal in mind. Marshall spoke a lot to older teens and many of the first followers were men in their late teens or early 20s. He also spoke to these men about how their parents didn't own them and how they should break free of their confines at the parental home. Now, cast your mind back to Marshall and his previous firing for his relationship with a teen he was teaching, and you can see the correlation here. Now with scrutiny of the cult starting to happen, and also the media getting involved, this is where the really culty things started to happen. If you're not familiar with the traits of a cult, and I suggest you learn these now, just in case you're in this situation, you know for the future. They asked followers to distance themselves from anyone who would potentially interfere with their work, like family and friends. They were told that they had to adhere to the policies of the group, and to relinquish their names. They were also made financially dependent on the group, and provided jobs by them. 
but ultimately they gave up their whole lives and made them completely embedded in the group, which made it very difficult for them to leave. With this crackdown on freedom and things getting seemingly more serious, many members left at this point, which effectively concentrated the group down to its most committed members. The ones that were left were given very strict rules to live by, with instructions on how to do everything, how to cook meals for the group, what to wear, and even how to shave, with the men being told that they could only shave their faces in a certain direction. The group's existence was focused on removing humanity from their activities and making things as sterile and removed from human as possible, so everyone was required to be androgynous in appearance. So the women cut their hair short, everyone wore very plain clothes, and no jewellery or heels or anything that was deemed to be too gendered was allowed. Grouped into this behaviour was a strict request that all members remain celibate and that they were not to have relationships with each other, even if they come into the group already in a relationship. Even when members of the group went outside, they weren't allowed to look around apart from the direction that they were going in, just in case they saw somebody that they might find attractive. Marshall was becoming quite sneaky with his ways of controlling the cult, but also with evading authorities that were interested in investigating what was going on there. To keep away, the group was constantly on the move, going from town to town, and they would rent these big houses to have everyone inside, but they only let a few members out at any one time, so the same people would be seen by the people living in the town, making them think that there were only a few people living in the house and not the whole cult. As time progressed, Bonnie was suffering from cancer and had to have an operation to remove her eye. She didn't believe doctors who told her she didn't have a very good chance of survival, as she believed she was going to ascend to heaven with her body. So when in 1985 she passed away, Marshall had to converse with the aliens to find out what was happening. It was from here he was told that the old body needed to die in order for a new one to be provided in heaven. And as such, Bonnie had ascended into heaven to receive her new body as her old one was damaged. With Bonnie now in heaven, she began communicating back to Marshall, who, because of their intense bond, was the only one who could interpret these messages. Bonnie said she would be back to collect everyone at some point when they were ready. Fast forward another few years to 1987, and the families of the cult members were starting to get antsy that they hadn't seen their loved ones for upwards of 10 years in some cases, and facing mounting pressure, Marshall decided that everyone in the group, if they wanted, could make a visit to see their family on Mother's Day in 1987. Previously to this, people were allowed to call and send letters, but no face-to-face -face contact had been made in a very long time. This was quite risky for Marshall because as ultimately he knew that the people that went on the visits may not return, and some of them didn't. But again, this led to further distilling of the group down to its most dedicated and unwavering members. However, the group was really starting to thin out, and by 1994, Marshall, who was now going by the name Doe all the time, had decided to start holding more public meetings in hope of recruiting some more members. The message of the group was also changing, and what with Bonnie's death and her not returning for almost 10 years, the talk of possibly having to die to ascend to the level above human, as they referred to it, was looking like it might be the only option for them. So by this time, Marshall was really ramping up the cult-like behaviour. New recruits were indoctrinated quickly into the group and told they were now never to see their families again. No visits home were to be made, and they were to leave their old lives behind. Their new lives were the group. He even dispensed with the pretense that this wasn't a cult, and was now openly calling it so. Let's hear Marshall explain that. Now, breaking away from the world is not easy. It's difficult. It's tough. And breaking away doesn't mean that, you know, I'm, I'm going to go live in some place with this little cult and I'll, you know, sp spend time on weekends or at least on holidays with the family that I left because they're my family. No. It means that you leave that world behind. You even become another individual. It means that even the mind that you had as a human is aborted and the soul that was given to you is filled with next level information next level mind and a new creature is born so with marshall's new message the actions of the group started to become quite extreme they were strangely going further than marshall had asked them to do so and two members of the group, in a quest to deal with their celibacy issues and desire to not have any dealings with their sexuality, decided they would opt for castration. 
even though this wasn't a requirement of the group. However, after careful consideration, they didn't go through with it. At least those two members didn't go through with it. You'll have to wait for a bit to find out more on that. The commitment to the cult didn't end there though. Control of their physical form was still a huge thing for the group, and as such they would often fast for long periods. They would ask initiates in particular to fast for 30 days to show they were serious about getting in control of their physical bodies. This meant that if they were able to do this, they could tap into a clearer mind state. Or maybe one that could be easily controlled. The drink they were allowed on the fast was something you may have heard of if you've ever done fad diets before. If you're protecting yourself from that sort of thing at the moment and don't want to hear the recipe for the fast, then pardon the pun, but fast forward about 30 seconds. The cleanse was made up of lemon or lime juice, cayenne pepper and maple syrup. And with this cleanse, you're allowed to drink as much of it as you want, but no food is allowed. The recommended amount of time that people do that diet is only 10 days though, as being without actual solid food for such a long time is not great for your health. However, this type of control over food would have been very helpful for keeping cult members in line, and presumably when these things were getting a bit out of line, the cleanse was brought back in for all members. With things rumbling along and a few despondencies in theories between the group, things had started to become a bit stagnant, and Heaven's Gate was at a turning point of whether it should continue or dissolve, but something was about to happen that would bring the cult to its end. The comet Hale-Bopp had been spotted above Earth and was the brightest comet seen for decades. As such, it was visible on Earth for around about 18 months. Marshall took the comet as a sign from Bonnie that she was on her way back to Earth to collect everyone, and as such, the cult started preparing to leave Earth. Marshall believed that Earth was going to be recycled, and that the only way to avoid being killed was to take matters into his own hands, and the hands of the cult. This way they were jumping, and not being pushed, and as such, would be collected by the UFO inside the comet. The arrival of the comet also coincided with the depressive episode that Marshall was having, where he was seemingly speaking a lot about the end. So if he was going down, everyone was going with him. However, this information wasn't widely known by the cult, and little did they know how imminent this endpoint was. But Marshall let them know a few days beforehand that time was up, and everyone was on board. They were ready to ascend. A few days before, they all went out for dinner for one last meal, where they all ate the same thing, because of course they did. They had a three-course meal for each member of a tomato vinaigrette salad, turkey pot pie for their main course, and a blueberry cheesecake for dessert. Which sounds like a pretty good last meal to me. <laughs> and they all had an iced tea as well. Despite the weird ordering of the same thing for everyone, everything according to the restaurant workers seemed perfectly fine, and this wasn't their first trip to the restaurant either. After their bizarre but quaint meal, which seemingly was the celebration of the end times, the cult returned home to the mansion they were renting in San Diego, and that was the last time any of them were seen alive in the outside world. The next two days was a time of preparation. The members excitedly recorded exit interviews, which would be left behind for people to see after their deaths, and they prepared themselves to take the big leap. Every member donned their androgynous black uniform, which was a kind of tracksuit, which had a patch on the arm that read Heaven's Gate Away Team. Which, I'm not sure if that was meant to be humorous, but I've now ordered that patch off Etsy, so... Um... So this was an incredibly exciting time for the group. Let's hear a little bit of their exit interviews. We're going to begin our interviews today with Sirodi. How long have you been in this classroom circumstance? Um, I've been in here since Valentine's Day, 21 years ago. Okay, and is there anything in particular you would like to say? There's so much I want to say to you. I, I would really strongly recommend, if you could find Heaven's Gate, the book, or the website, you know, go there, study it, read it. Um, it would do you a lot of good. Um, maybe on a more personal note, I mean, this is, this is the answer to everything. You know, these, these flesh vehicles, I mean, if you use the analogy of a car, People may keep their cars for a long time before they finally wear out and they clunk out and they die on them and, you know, they go and get another car. Or some people, they say, well, you know, here's a newer model, it's much nicer, and this one, you know, doesn't quite perform the way I could, and I'd like to move into this new car. So get rid of the old one and get a new one. I mean, that's about all we're talking about. It's not a big deal. This isn't a troubling circumstance. Don't take it as that. It's just, 
Just a gateway, just a doorway. Okay, thank you. What we're about to do is certainly nothing to think negatively about. We're all choosing of our own free will to go to the next level with T and Do. That's right. And they are certainly not what the media is going to paint them out to be. I never got to meet T in this incarnation in her human vehicle, but I can tell you that Do is the most special, dignified, unhuman, objective person that you can ever meet. That's right. He has helped us so much and put up with so much and never done anything that <laughs> seemed even close to the way a human would respond. And I guess that's really all I want to say. <laughs> like I said, we all feel very emotional about um, the gift that we've been given. And I'm the happiest person in the world. Okay, thank you very much. So with that, everything was ready, and they were about to head off, dressed in their black tops, sweatpants, and Nike decade trainers, and with a $5 bill and three quarters in their pockets, enough to pay any fees for crossing over, and also a few quarters for the payphone when they got there, obviously. Each member was provided with a mix to consume of apple sauce or blancmange, which Americans, you call that pudding, which was mixed with phenobarbital and washed down with a drink of vodka. Effectively, a strong mix of sleeping tablets and very strong alcohol. This mix would have knocked the person out, and the combination of the two substances would slow the breathing until the point where it just stopped and they would calmly slip away. However, in order to speed things up, a plastic bag was also secured around the head, and then subsequently removed by the remainder of the group to leave things a little more dignified. The ceremony was split into three groups of two sets of 15 and one set of nine. This allowed group one to go and then for group two to tidy up after them, and group two to go with group three to tidy up, and then group three had to just sort themselves out, but the last two people were left on their own. Marshall was the third to last person to go, and as such he was laid out and presented with his purple shroud over his head, but the last two people were sadly found with their plastic bags still attached. A member of the cult, Rio D'Angelo, who had left to go on an evangelical mission six weeks earlier, was the first to be notified of the deaths by a letter he received from the cult. He was told a door would be left unlocked for him to enter through, and as such, he made his way to the mansion to investigate. When he arrived, everything was as he expected. He was met with 39 bodies which had been sitting in the mansion for three days, which, understandably in the California heat, had begun to get a little smelly. He called in an anonymous tip to the police, but later admitted it was him that had done so. He also took along a video camera because he wanted to document the event, saying he wanted it to be reported clearly what had happened, just in case there was any intervention with the bodies once the police arrived. When the police did arrive, they confirmed the suicides and sent them to be autopsied. There were 21 women and 18 men, ranging between 26 and 72. And interestingly enough, eight of the men had been castrated. So despite this not being something that Marshall had requested of the group, there was now definitive evidence that this practice had happened. Oh, and also, Marshall was one of those eight. After the bodies had been found, the police started the long process of informing the families of the deceased, which took some time due to the lack of communication the members had had with their families. For some, it had been 20 years since they'd joined the cult, with very little contact in that time. In the interest of keeping things neat and to make the return of their loved ones easier, all of the bodies were cremated, and best efforts were made to reunite ashes with as many family members as possible. Strangely enough, after the event, four more people died, with one copycat who cited his reasons as wanting to join the cult on the spacecraft, and three former cult members who must have felt like they'd missed out. So with all these people dead, now it was down to the cult to make contact. Had they been successful in ascending to a higher plane, and more importantly, did they use their quarters to make those phone calls? Mm, no. However, previous members of the cult did believe that they'd been successful in ascending and reuniting with Bonnie. I can't quite wrap my head around a few things that I've told you about here, and so here's a few things I think about this case that I can't get out of my head, so I'm going to give you these thoughts so you can help me with them too. So let's start off with Marshall. 
The job thing and being fired for his relationship with the boy, his own sexuality and his choice to be castrated all seem like personal problems which he pushed onto other people in a way to make his insecurities seem valid and okay to him. To me, it seems like he may have been disgusted with himself and never came to terms with the things that happened to him or the public humiliation that he suffered as a result. So he decided to make the group as a buffer for his feelings and as a way to deal with this. Bonnie, I don't understand why she ran away and left her children behind. Perhaps because she was unhappy in her marriage and wanted to bond with somebody but not a relationship. And maybe that's why she chose Marshall. Also putting all of that strangeness of the inception of the cult together, perhaps the people that believed the UFO and Ascension theory were completely sold on that, and that if they wanted to remove themselves from the planet, who are we to judge? I guess the only thing that gripes with me is that the age of 72 is, yeah, you've lived your life, and you're probably ready to move on, but at 26, you've still got a long old road ahead of you out there. Now, usually I like to wrap up with a neat bow, but today I can't because there's too much to think about. So instead, I'm going to throw it over to you guys. So leave your thoughts in the comments below or on my social media, because I don't think there's a finite answer to this one. Your only chance to survive or evacuate is to leave with us. If you enjoyed that episode and you're not already, then please subscribe to the YouTube channel or the podcast or both and give the video a thumbs up and the podcast a rating because it really helps people to find the show. A huge big thanks to our executive Patreon producers, Sam, Barry, Veronica and Sarah, and all of our other patrons too. If you want more content from me, like the new show I have on Patreon, which is regaling weird things I find in old newspapers when I'm doing research for the show, then please check that out. Access to extra content starts at just $5 a month, which is just £4.50, and supporting the show starts at just $1, so about 75p. And you can also get access to some tangible goodies too, depending on what tier you're on. I'll leave the link in the description for that so you can check it out if you'd like to. Thank you for joining me for another macabre mini mystery. I've been Nikki Druce, and I'll see you ghouls next time. Very clear. Like I said, we all feel very emotional about um, the gift that we've been given. And I'm the happiest person in the world. Okay, thank you very much.